Hello. Hello. Oh, whoops. Didn't mean to have myself open over here. Guess that means that's working. Um, I'm going to wait for a few minutes before I make my announcement so that I can be sure that I've given everyone a chance to show up. But um, in the meantime, I'm just going to sit here and keep being productive because I have a lot to do. So um, that's what's going on right now. <coughs> uh, for the people watching this on the archive, I apologize for being boring, not uh you know cutting out <laughs> this part but i mean you're the one who's choosing to watch the archive i'm just saving it because this is a particularly important four coder stream today that i want to have on the record for anyone who misses it essentially croifa yes is essentially already on friday actually what happened was I get a day off, like I get basically one weekday a week to do four cutter stuff. Uh, plus two if I use a, if I go to work on a weekend. Um, and uh, since the rad air conditioner is broken, I decided to let them give them a, try to get my two days of off time in now, and hopefully they'll have it fixed before I go back. So that's the plan. So that makes today Friday, and then tomorrow Saturday, and then we can resume with Tuesday on Wednesday, uh, on Thursday. That's the plan. Arena. Buffer ID. Top left. I have to figure out the visible range. Um, oh, that's buffer point, not top left. Uh, so buffer point, top left. In buffer P0, I think is wrong, but I'm just going to put that in there verbatim for now because I'm pretty sure we don't have the. I'm pretty sure that's not a part of the way the model works anymore. And so, as I am rewriting this new code, which I will explain shortly, announcement will happen. Uh, I want to stay on topic until I have an announcement finished, and then I want to stay on topic forever until I have a lot of code done. I mean, look, here's the thing. Usually when I stream, I, r I recognize that the stream's going to like distract me a little bit. And so if I choose to stream and you know not stay offline at work on my own, I'm kind of accepting a small amount of distraction. But um, this will ne definitely not be a day where I go off and do other things. So I have like this to-do list. Like this half is about this part is about halfway done. This stuff is all done now. 
but that was actually all just an expansion of the like uh, f the first item there. Uh, there's a couple of other things in here that I haven't even touched. Um, the second item, the second big item in there that I started working on is this page when I expanded it, and you can see I'm making some progress on this page. About half of that's done, so today I hope to get most of that page of to-do items done. But each of those, like that half a page, each one of them expands to about 15 to 20 to-do items. Um, so we are going to try to get a lot of stuff done as quickly as possible for a little while here in the Four Coder universe. Um, Alright, so I think I've, I'm seeing a lot of people saying hi, I see a lot of different names, so that suggests to me that I provided ample time for people to come to be here for the live announcement of what I decided to do. Um, so, uh, for the longest time, basically going back to the beginning of this year, I started making big changes that were API breaking changes that was basically, the idea was to get all of the changes done in one build that would uh, set up everyone to have the correct API for all the things that already exist and then the next build after that would be a couple bug fixes build before finally going into a beta build 4.1.0 which would preserve the API people would already have switched to but expand it and add new features and upgrade the core to do certain performance things that are currently like unfeasible. Um, turns out that the thread I started pulling back in January that I've been pulling on ever since all the changes that I thought I could contain to one build, just keep on pouring over and pouring over, and it's gotten now we're almost to the end of August, and there still hasn't even been the first API breaking change, which I thought was going to take like half a year, and we're now eight months into the year. So, um, a couple days ago, I sat down to start looking at some stuff, and I realized that the number of things on my to-do list now to finish the beta is actually not that many if I don't try to contain the changes. If I let things that I was trying to contain, if I just let them spill over and rewrite everything that they touch, rather than trying to make like transition boundaries between stuff, it's actually kind of easier for me to just get everything right if I just go ahead and do the full rewrite. So, I've rewritten most of the platform layer. I kind of did that without announcing that that's what I was doing, but I rewrote how things in the platform layer were working that were not correct. Um, I have the new file change notification system working, so the threads are available to the core system and they now do file change notifications. And um, the rendering of text is now immediate mode, so the next big goal is to make it so that 100% of the token highlighting, including the parsing of tokens themselves, is achieved in the immediate mode text coloring system. And in order to get that far, I need to uh, beef up the text layout system so that it is completely um, uh, sort of flexible to the buffer contents, the layout information from the width and the font, and uh, kind of dynamic, so that if you, um, dynamically cached I mean, so that like if you have a giant file, it doesn't need to rewrap the entire file every time an edit happens, it only needs to rewrap the section on the view, in the view over and over again, right? Um, then what I plan to do is to make virtual white space, which I've currently deprecated out of the system. I intend to re-implement it in a way that the customization layer can control. Um, so that way I can re-implement uh, virtual white space the way it used to work exactly or close to exactly how it used to work but as a custom layer callback or loop or something. Once that's in there um, I intend to build a basically an indexer that will find function names, type names, stuff like that and uh, scope ranges and drive the auto indenting from that data structure to speed it up and also use that for highlighting things we could never highlight before. So that's the idea. Four coder one point four coder four point one point oh the beta version is my next build. Um, this means that if you've already purchased um, the alpha that your purchase doesn't carry over it's probably not going to be priced any much more than it already was, I don't think. I, but um, I am going to make a new itch page for it, and I can't find any way to give people discounts if they've already got four quarter alpha. I'll keep trying to talk itch into it. But besides that, I think it's mostly good news. Um, a lot of the rewrite has already happened. String types are completely done. Um, uh, everything is now indexed on 64 bits, so you're not limited to 4 gigabyte files, which, I mean, you're already limited to, like, megabyte files for other reasons, but that's also going to go. Um, 
there's a whole new uh, color palette system that needs to get wrapped up at some point. Um, uh, yeah, and that's about it. That's basically everything that needs to happen for this to become the beta build. Um, just for perspective on why I made this decision, if I had gone ahead and tried to keep it in the alpha stage and just put, put up boundaries, then to make the text highlighting thing really work correctly, I would have to do some extremely complicated ordering stuff so that the internal thing could color stuff the way it already does from tokens and from um, like, like when it highlights bad tokens and stuff. That would need to be interleaved and ordered in a weird and very confusing way with basically an API that would mean nothing the moment it was removed from the core. Um, the color palette system would be impossible to finish because the color palette system really only works from the perspective of how do a cu how does a customizer specify the set of colors they're going to use, which you can't flexibly do if I'm controlling the keyword highlighting. So I can't really completely finish my construction of the uh, color palette until I switch to beta mode. Um, customizable wrapping uh, has been a long-term to-do item that really the only reason this is happening now is because once I rewrite the thing that puts all of the keyword highlighting in the custom layer, if I don't, you can't do that. So that's not a feature. That's an example of something that I have to do that's a little extra work, but I think it's worth it anyway. It's something people have wanted for a long time. It'll pay off a lot, and it's required if I want to do the things I'm trying to do without making them much harder than they really are. So this is what's happening. So the other part of this announcement is well, I'm going to show you something. This is the first file I ever made when I was working on Forcoder. 4ed.cpp was literally the first file. You can see I didn't even know the name was going to be Forcoder. I just called it Project Codename 4 I haven't touched this comment since December 12th of 2014. So it, by before the end of this year, on December 12th of this year, I will have been working on Forcoder for five years. So I'm working to get this beta ready for Handmade Seattle. But if it doesn't happen for that, it'll at least be ready for the fifth year anniversary. But I'll also be having more special announcements and changes to Forcoder coming the fifth year anniversary of my working on it. Um, until then, just know that my main focus now is the beta. And um, once it's out, there will be more things to discuss. Um, things this isn't changing, the Forcoder issues GitHub list is still going to be relevant. I'm still using that to try to drive a lot of things that need to get changed or fixed if there's still a problem once the beta comes out. But keep in mind that any bug that you had before, there's about an 80% chance that I've rewritten some of the code that contributed to it. So yeah, it's kind of hard to deal with bugs from older builds at this point. Um, I think, looking at my notebook, I've covered everything worth covering. Um, I guess there are a few other things that Forcoder to-do list, um, the Forcoder to-do list is still kind of not public and that's one of the things there will be more announcements about once the beta is ready. But I guess I will just tease that I plan to make a more um, more visible frontward facing side to Forcoder in terms of the website and tutorials, usability stuff once beta has hit. So um, there'll be more on what that entails once the beta is actually out. Anyway, that's the announcement. Announcement time over. I'm now going to play, since this video is a special one that's getting archived, I'm now going to play some copyright in, uh, uh, unencumbered playlist that I randomly selected earlier before the stream started. It's not quite the jam session that my streams normally are. After about an hour or so of this, if it's driving me crazy, I will probably shut the stream down and switch it to a jam session. But I need to be able to archive at least the announcement and some of the fun stuff that happens afterwards. So before I get straight back to work, let me know if there are any questions, comments, thoughts from the, you know, from the live viewers, and I'll address them. And while you're asking, I will start just typing in little bits of code um, that are not too heavy.
One Lives Left says, I could use a quick summary of the announcement which I just missed. The quick summary is that I was originally planning to do a few more builds in the Alpha line, but at this point it seems like it's going to cost me more to do that than to just do the final rewrites that finish the beta version. So I'm canceling any future builds for the Alpha, and I am making the first beta build, which will get out by the end of the year, the fifth year anniversary of me starting Forecoder. Young Lane asks, I'm curious about the keyboard support for co different keyboard layouts. I currently have to use right alt to type things like open brace, close brace, etc., whereas you usually use control alt on my keyboard layout. Okay, so that is one of the things that's going to get a major overhaul that I didn't mention. So, um, not included on the list of things I'm doing, it, or that I met, that I, not included on the list of things I mentioned that I am going to do is I want to, um, uh, I want to add, um, like, I want to basically rewrite the the custom command map system. That's kind of one of the clunkiest systems right now. And in re rewriting it, I have two different goals. One, um, the the way you specify them right now makes it very hard for you to have a plugin ecosystem where I just borrow someone else's code for a UI system they created in the there's an immediate mode renderer now so you kind of can just code up your own UI but to get input from the user you still have to go through a fairly clunky command mapping system so what I want to switch to is something where I can just copy someone's file put it in and there's like one function call that I make and that one function call kicks off a command that renders some UI in my system and let, interacts with my inputs and all of the code for con containing all of the file that contains all the code for controlling that behavior can be in one spot and I don't have to go and link up to other things except to call the thing that launches that, right? So that's one thing I need to change. The other thing I need to change about the command maps is that they were kind of written around an, like just an English centric perspective of how keyboard input needed to work. I've now written several input systems that are way way better um, and I know what it takes to make a correct one well at least a more correct one there's not really any way to make a really super perfect one because of operating systems being confusing but um, I can get a lot closer than I did before and so yeah that will that will be improved a lot uh, text input will be text input and clearer and it will be separated from um, command control in a way that it currently isn't and you kind of have to go that direction to get keyboard support correct. JmanC3 asks, is there any plans to fully expose writing to the custom layer? Sorry I missed the first part of the stream. So that's not exactly the plan. Um, there is an immediate mode renderer that lets you send out basically commands to render text and rects to the screen. Well, quads basically solid quads and um, like text, like font t textured quads can go to the screen, right? really just strings can go to the screen. And then there's a backend renderer. Now the plan, this might not be happen in the first iteration of the beta, like version 4.1.0 might not have this, but the plan, and this is a plan that will take more precedent once the beta is out, is it's more of a beta type thing to do in my opinion. Um, is to take up forecoder and chop out more custom areas than what I have so far. So right now there's the custom layer and its role in the Forkrutter core is basically that it contributes knowledge about how events are handled and how they how like what things get placed where on the screen. Basically it does the very high level decision making um, that forms your par editing paradigm and stuff like that. Um, I also want to make a separate module that's drop-in replaceable for the back-end renderer. So what that means you could do is you could make a drop-in renderer that has extended commands and then call upon those commands from your custom side, right? But I'm not planning to go so far as to say, here, start making OpenGL calls in your, um, uh, in your, like, render 
the thing or whatever, right? Or in, in your custom layer directly. Um, I, I, it's more important to me that you have the ability to port the renderer to other backends so that you can move it wherever it needs to go rather than to try to make it so that you can put like bitmaps in where bitmaps weren't used to be available. But once I make the custom renderer a thing, so you can customize the renderer layer and you can customize the what I call custom layer. It'll be called the high level layer in beta. Or the decision layer or something. The high level layer will be um, po like the high level layer will be able to do that stuff if you also write your cut renderer layer yourself and have them cooperate correctly. But the more you rewrite, you know, the more you're making your own application, which is fine. It's up to you to go that far. But my plan is just to make it easy to drop in, replace these things so that you can customize behavior. You can port to different renderers and you can port to different operating systems. Another one I want to do. Uh, I'm going to uh, chop out the operating system module and make that drop in replaceable as well. Um, and essentially spec out the APIs for each of these so that you can very easily just write any one of these things that you need to replace or customize. That's the plan. Level 5 HM says, why did you decide to make this beta a separate product? I may have missed something in the beginning. Um, okay, so, I mean, there's two reasons. Um, the first one is that I can't separate out, like, there's a, the beta is a very big change from the alpha in a lot of places. So if there's anyone who doesn't want to update to the beta, like they're looking at it and they're like, man, that's going to be a lot of work to update my customization. I'd rather just get this one bug fix. I may go back and do a couple of quick, dirty bug fixes on the alpha branch. So I need to be able to publish them under separate like branches, right? Now, that still doesn't answer your question, your like implicit question of why would the separate product be paid for separately? Um... And the answer to that is I really wouldn't mind saying that everyone who has the alpha gets the beta, except that I need those to be separate pages on itch. And I kind of do want to raise the price moving forward. Like, I didn't feel comfortable charging a reasonable price when I thought it was an alpha, but as I'm moving towards a final product, I don't think that $12 is the price point that it would land on. Um, it might be more like $25 to give you perspective of what I'm thinking. What I'd like to do is get itch to give everyone a coupon who owns the alpha for like 50% off on the beta because, hey, you've already paid that much and you've like been supporting me for longer so it's worth something to me that you've been there and I'm happy to, you know, pay that back, but in a sense. But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't really... Like, I don't have the money to keep doing four coder forever if I don't, like, raise that price point and um, ask for a little more. I know that that makes some people frustrated or, um... upset with me when I say stuff like that, but it's just the truth. I can't keep working on Fort Coder if I don't get more money to come in. And I think it's been a while since I... There's like hundreds of people now who haven't contributed anything because they bought Fort Coder two years ago. And... It just seems like it's been enough... There's been enough new work that everyone could could afford to chip in again at uh, the reasonable price of 15 more dollars if itch will help me or 25 if they won't.
So uh, one lives left asks. Um, so when you when are you going to go from beta to release? So basically, my definitions of alpha, beta, and release are like this. Alpha is the stage of the project in which you don't know for sure what you even want to make, and you are experimenting and exploring the space. Arguably, I've kind of not been in alpha for about a year. I've known where I want to go, but I was still not ready to call it beta because I haven't built the thing that I mean for it to be. I just have discovered what I mean for it to be, and I'm still trying to drive the whole code base there. It becomes beta roughly around the place where you know what you're trying to make and you're not there, or you're kind of there, but it's got a lot of rough edges. So it'll go from beta to release when I know things like I've got a really, like I've got the ability to do things like I, I, you aren't going to lose temporary files if forecoder crashes or your system loses power and you have unsaved changes. Like there's some kind of temporary save system, if not at least a continuously saving system in forecoder. There's going to be things like you have less than one crash a month and that doesn't isn't originated from a bug in the custom layer that you wrote yourself right um like if i if i am very confident that the crashes are super rare if not as eliminated as at all possible that like it doesn't have other weird things like oh if i initialize it with command line files and there are more than three files this happens and then it crashes like that kind of stuff still happens and it's going to still happen while it's in beta and my definition of beta is like look it's become or it is still close to becoming the thing that it is going to be on release but it has rough edges that are not production level quality stuff like this is not as like just bulletproof as it could be it's not nailed down it's not polished up so release is that what is the timeline for that I don't know it's really hard to say um, that's, yeah. Oh, um, no, release will probably be another, like, it'll just go from 4.1x to 4.1x plus 1, and that'll be, I'll take the beta name off of it when I'm ready to say that the polish is at the right level. It'll only ever, I'll only ever charge again when I increment that middle number. 4.1, 4.2 would be the next thing I'd charge for again. And that's only going to happen when I feel like I've done um, enough substantial work that it's not even like that I have that that it's basically a new thing with a similar look and feel. Like if it's at least fifty percent rewritten, like this is not just oh I've up like I've increased the polish this much. I deserve more money. No, it's going to be like half the code in here wasn't here when everyone paid for it. So it's a new product kind of thing. JMC516, do you do a Unity build? Uh, yes and no. So I do several stages of building that can't be combined into a Unity build. Um, so since I compile on three different platforms, I have a build.cpp and I build this first. It's a single file and it just contains, it has a couple of includes for like string types and stuff that are actually, this is apparently eliminated, but there's like, you know, my thing for moving around files. Um, this is just information I need to know about the version number and my base types, right? So basic include stuff. But then, um, down here, it just describes like what things I can build as C code, well, C++ code, but C code. Um, and I build and run that. So that thing gets built as a Unity build, and then it builds a series of Unity builds. So then the next Unity build is my meta generator, and it has to build and then run the meta generator to generate some code. Same thing happens here. The experiments gets built once in pre-process only mode, and then I parse it with my metadata gener uh, metadata generator. So this gets Unity built. It, then the result from that Unity build runs on the output from the four coder experiments preprocessor run. This one. Then using that metadata, I Unity build this file again, right? And that generates the actual custom layer. Then finally, I Unity build this file app target which creates the core and then whatever operating system I'm targeting I unity build its target so win 32 for it so how is that a unity build if they're not all in the same spot uh, they're not all each each executable or DLL file is one file right so each of every time I do another build I'm unity building a separate executable blob of data um, that run separately from other things. So in the sense that each executable I build or DLL that I build is Unity, yes. But the whole build system has more than one step to it because there are things going on. 
Why not yearly subscription model? Um, because I don't want... Okay, a bunch of reasons. First of all, I don't even have an easy way to manage that. I don't have the resources to set up like a, like a complicated payment system. I just like to use itch and I don't have that, I don't think. Secondly, I could like try to get itch to do that, but that's not going to happen. I could try to use itch that way by making a new page. I don't want to do that. But more importantly than all of those things, I just don't like subscriptions anyway. I mean, um, I just don't like that setup. I, um, I never like to pay for a yearly subscription. I usually avoid it. And I'm guessing that some of the people paying for Fork Order now would feel the same way. Another set of them would probably pay way more for it if I did that. Like on a yearly basis, they'd pay the $12 or whatever. And the thing is, is I'd rather have less money and more users. Uh, because I only need the money to keep me going, not to, like, um, pay for my life. And having users means I've done something to help people. My compile time right now is about three seconds, maybe four seconds, which is not great. Sometimes when I'm getting annoyed by the compile time, what I have to do is come over here to my build file and go to my standard build and be like, all right, I don't need to do metagen for a little while. I don't need to build the experiment. Like right now, the thing I'm building is all in the core. So I could just eliminate that and get that as my build time. Still not great, but it's better. Um, uh, one of the things I te intend to do at some point is to rewrite my build system again. Because there's a lot of stuff in there that could be better. Um, that I like, I could merge the platform and core back to each other. That was uh, for a little while. I was trying some experiments where they were separated, and it just never paid off. And now I just pay a compile time cost that because I haven't bothered to remerge them. Um, so yeah, there's 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 there are there are issues in the four coder code base for sure. Not gonna not going to say that there aren't, and I'm not recommending copying everything that I've done <sighs> by any stretch of the imagination. you also notice that I'm using, I'm no longer using the most recent version of Fork Cutter. Up until recently I used the most recent version of Fork Cutter, but I'm making such sweeping changes right now that I can't. So you get this weird bug where while it tries to mark my parentheses, it accidentally marks the wrong character because I screwed that up in 4.0.3. Which is the version I'm running? Text layout new. Yeah, so we need to grab that arena. Come over here to buffer. I want to run essentially that. So. What's going on here? Auto indent, thank you. Okay. Is there any plan to add plugin support? Define plugin support. I mean, the custom layer can do. The custom layer is more general than a plugin system, so anyone could write a plugin system for four coder. If you're asking if I'm planning to make a thing where you have a specifically defined API that you can write to to make a plugin and then list them as a core feature or as a default customization layer feature, I'm not planning to go quite that far is the answer. I'm, at, I'm planning to go more kind of to the point where it's not a UI element but a API design choice that you can easily grab someone's file and drop it into your custom layer and rebuild it. But if you're not rebuilding, if you're not building custom layers, then no, I'm not planning to go quite that far yet. Uh, I might go that far by the time I call it release. I might say like, look, we need to be able to let default users drop in plugins, but I'm not sure that I'll go that far. I'll have to think about that one. That's actually something I've considered a lot. I don't love that. Us that stuff usually drives me nuts when I try to use it, and I don't know if I have a solution for what the things that drive me nuts. So maybe not. But at least to the point I want to be able to have like the community contributes. Like, oh, here's my 
little folder, and in it I have some code that, like, you know, turns Forcoder into a really smart list editor or whatever the frick you want to do, right? And then you can just grab those files and integrate it easily into your own custom layer is kind of the way I want plugins to work. There has to be a little bit of programmer smarts and put piecing things together there, though. It's not like um, drag and drop automatic, grab a file and load it in type plugin. Hope that answers your question. Alright, we need to go over here and get a buffer layout item list. That's our layout. And then go buffer layout. Uh, I want to pass it, or I need to pass it a scratch, which I can get from doing this. Um, come on, come on. Yep. Yep, like that. Scratch block scratch. Arena. We need to get the files buffer. I need to know the visible range. I need to know the face, and I need to know the layout dim that width. Okay. So we can start getting some of those things. The face, uh, we acquire that by going to the font, or the face set, font set, get face from ID. I need to pass that the models font set, and then uh, the file settings font, I believe. Let's check that out. Come on. There we go. Uh, settings, font ID. Okay. So, so far, I will only answer it. So the question is, what do you feel like you are most proud of with this project? What is the best feature that no other editor has? So I will answer that question only with respect to things I've actually successfully published and not with respect to things I have in my brain now that I'm trying to create. I think I have two things about Forcoder that I find noteworthy, like things I would discuss with other people if I was talking about making editors better. One is the C customization layer. I think um, almost every editor that gets widely adopted as like a power editor type thing has some way to customize it because there's it's a very personal thing the way you edit your text. It has a lot to do with what type of text you're editing on a regular basis and what style you have even within that format. So you could have two different C++ programmers with very different styles who want very different feature sets. Um, and so the ability to customize that from C code or from any code is pretty valuable to those people. I like the, uh, the fact that this is customized from C because I like the language C and there wasn't anything like that before. I think a lot of people look at that as a questionable decision too. Like there, It's not necessarily obvious that a compiled language for customization is going to be good for you, but for some people it is. So I think that that is noteworthy and helpful and as a proof of concept of a way a lot of things should be written or could be written for the right users at least, right? Like I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is there are a lot of people who would also look at that and go, no, that was a bad move because now you have to compile your customizations rather than just writing the script. Um, but there are other people who look at it and go, thank goodness that I don't have to write the script and I can just use my compiler the way I use my compiler for everything else. Um, especially for people in the games industry who I'm most closely related to, like that's the space that I swim in, that's the s water that I swim in, um, that's the space that I fly in. I, a lot of people use C and C++, so it's the language they're most comfortable with and the language that their code base is already in, and it just pays off a lot to have that as your customization language, and Forcoder proves pretty well that that just works really nicely um, for those people. Uh, the other thing that I'm proud of is virtual white space. I've never seen anything like it attempted. I still haven't seen anyone try to attempt anything like it. And I think that although virtual white space in Forcoder has a lot of problems, it was actually fairly easy to get it up and running. And with the benefit of hindsight, I have an even better plan for how to make it customizable. And at that point, it's going to be better. But even without that, even with the lack of customization and the like, relatively 
poor performance of it on large files, it still pays off a lot um, to have it in my editor. And a lot of other people have told me as much that they that that's the reason they use Fork Editor, that it has a virtual white space and that it changes editing for them completely. I think that that's something that at this point I would say was the other thing. It was only a minor success because of the number of problems it had, but it was still so novel and I think that is kind of in a proof of like proof of concept in the sense that even with those problems it paid off so much therefore this is something people should take more seriously when they make their editor is you know taking away the responsibility for indentation and layout work that you would normally just say look it's an editor they're supposed to control the number of spaces honestly we just don't care about that in most languages we just want it to get get it right from the context all the time and it can and that's why it was a good that's why that's what we learned from virtual white space what is virtual white space let me answer that after I catch up on a couple other questions is there a global buffer string search in the currently released version of forecode I remember there being one but I can't seem to find it if it exists right now okay is there a global buffer like a global buffer string search yeah there totally is so you can do uh, something like um, control shift F will find everything every place where I use the word struct and it just makes this list right here so here's a list of all the places where I move the struct. So I just you might have missed it. So I'm going to do Alt Shift F this time. Alt Shift F is different because it is case insensitive. So now I can find all of the cases of the word layout, and it'll give me uppercase and lowercase versions. So there it is again. I just type in the thing and I get the results. It's instantaneous. Um, you can then click on these by like putting your cursor on any of the lines you care about and pressing enter. And then you can just start jumping through all the cases where that happens. You can see that it sorts by buffer. So if you're like, I need one that's a dot .h file. I know it's in a header file somewhere. And you can just go, okay, well, search in this buffer of my results. Where are my dot .h's? And like, no, not that one, not that one. Oh, there it is. Layout. That's the one I need, right? Whatever. So yeah, there's a totally a, a global string search. Subspy says, this is not a code editor for beginners, correct? Well, yeah, I, I guess you could say that. It doesn't have IntelliSense or anything that's going to help you learn programming. It also doesn't really have an editing tutorial, so if you don't aren't a little bit familiar with how text editors are usually structured, right now it's not going to be super accessible. The goal of Forcoder isn't really to cater to learning to program. It's to cater to taking control of your programming environment when you know what you want out of programming. So... Yeah, I would say that it is, it's not really, it's just, that's not the audience at all, you know? Um, there are tools like that that are guided at programming things, IntelliSense, Code Intelligence, um, stuff like that that helps you learn programming while, like, um, it, there are also editors that come with, like, that are more accessible. They look like Notepad or Notepad++. They edit the way you would expect to edit right out of the box. Right, Forcoder is none of those things. It doesn't help you learn programming. It doesn't help you learn Forcoder editing. It doesn't do any of that. Um, it will at some point have a lot more tutorials than it has. Basically, as I'm moving from beta to release, I will also be working on things like tutorials. But no, right now, it's pretty user hostile. You have to be the person who wants to make th stuff work for yourself already uh, to get anything out of it so far. Um, that to said, yeah, you can just use it out of the box. It does, if you're asking if you need to be a programmer to use it, you don't necessarily need to be a programmer to use it. It does work right out of the box as a text editor if you're comfortable with learning its paradigm, its default paradigm. <sighs> okay, what is virtual white space? Let's answer that. So, virtual white space is this. Um, this file here, you see I can walk around and you know put spaces in and stuff so what's going on here is I do not have virtual white space this is how normal editors work so why is this happening in this file like I said there are problems with virtual white space there are limits to it in the current implementation and so this file is too big at almost 4,000 lines of code still um, it used to be more than 4,000 so I thought I'd shrunk it down but it's already back up to almost 4,000 point is it's too big to really for virtual white space to be performant it would slow down editing but if I go to a more moderately sized file Let's go over to buffer.cpp. Uh, at a more moderately sized file, you'll see if I try, I'm going to click right in there. I'm not faking it. I can't get in there. I can't 
No, if I just press right, it goes like there. If I press left, it goes there. There's nothing I can... If I, if I press backspace, it gets rid of the whole thing. And if I am here and I press enter, there's no spaces there. It's That's the beginning of the line, right? This is the beginning of the line as far as Forcoder is willing to let me know. Because virtual white space is on, which means the indentation at the beginning of every line is not up to me anymore. It's up to Forcoder. Now, that might seem like a bad thing if you are really concerned about the layout of your white space, but it turned out that me and a lot of programmers like me are the opposite of concerned about it. We're annoyed by the layout of white space at the beginning of our lines. We just want it to do something obviously nice looking. Like, right? So now I don't have to re indent ever. If I go like, okay, I need to insert a brace, you can see it just indented everything below it and th thought, okay, all of these must be nested like this. And then it does that again, right? It's just like that. It, it's doing that without even editing the text. That's just a layout engine that happens to be placed above the level of the text. So there's the text actual content, and then separate from the text actual content, there's the layout that the editor is presenting to me. So to present this in a different way, to, to demonstrate this in a different way, I can look at the column number here, column number 21. If I press space, that column number is going up. What's happening is I'm inserting spaces, and they are being ignored. Why would you want that? Again, because that is the correct position for the layout to be at, no matter what the spacing is. Alrighty. And that is it. I am caught up on questions. Um, So let me get a little more of this done. So what I'm doing over here is the text create text layout create is a part of the new way rendering happens. So um, its job is basically to render to to lay out a portion of a buffer's text inside of a rectangle that's going to go onto the screen, but it's not actually rendering it. It's just getting the layout. Then what'll happen is the user can paint colors onto that layout to alter the text colors. They can extract rectangles, like where is this character, given character you know, index 1000. If, a, if the character with the index of 1000 is in that range, it'll extract the rectangle, the box that surrounds that character. So you can put cursors wherever you want inside that box, relative to that box, whatever. You can extract lines and find out, oh, here's the Y height like, and interval. Uh, here's the, basically the, the interval of pixels covered by that line. So you get lots of layout information from this that lets you render stuff onto the screen. And then you can just say, okay, I'm done painting color onto the letters. I'm done putting rectangles on the screen plot that whole text down now. And so it'll take the text that it's already laid out and send that to the graphic system and put all the t text onto the screen with the colors you gave it on top of the rectangles you've been rendering underneath it. And then bloop, there's your text, right? That's the whole idea. Um, uh, and then you can free your layout and create other ones. You can create multiple layouts side by side and do them at the same time. You can, you can do whatever you need to to render stuff. So you'll no longer have four coder being like, oh, am I in buffer render mode, then I'm in charge. It actually isn't. The only thing that it does for you automatically is you ask for a layout and it gives you one. Um, a file with virtual white space gets um, automatically indented on save to match what you see in the editor. So um, if you're, for instance, if I see this and this actually line is all the way over to the left and then I go look at it in the debugger, if I just save this file so that this line is updated, it'll automatically put the spaces in to um, see the same thing in the, uh, in the uh, uh, debugger. The, the only time I've ever had, like people are saying like here strings cause problems, I actually have problems with here strings anyway, because even if I just eliminate virtual white space for a minute, let's take that off and I'll do show white space. So by show white space now all these gray spots are where there is white space. If I turn virtual white space back on you'll see that it doesn't show me white space there. Um, it literally doesn't believe anything is there. So now I can go into the white space. Suppose I have a here string and I'm like okay, uh, here's my foo and I want to do like the, the like, is, what is it, it's like R and then like foo and then foo again, right? You can see four coder in, uh, parses all that. Okay, great, so I have my string. All right, now, if I really want to make this look nice, I kind of want my first line 
to be here because otherwise the string is going to have a new line at the first lot spot. Like if I start here, like first line, that's false. The first line is up here, so my first line has to be at a different indentation than everything else because of the way here strings work in C++. Then, um, supposing I like put up with that and write like my shader or whatever is going on, right? And then I indent everything, right? It doesn't. It doesn't fix anything. So I guess that was a bad example. Let me say like I don't know. Whatever, right? It still doesn't indent correctly. It doesn't you can't do anything useful here. So here strings are just dumb. Here strings are just a relic of the fact that programming languages are garbage. There's an artifact of that problem. I don't see how anybody can do anything useful with that without breaking their back. I mean, I can see how you can do it, but you'd, like I said, you'd have to kind of break your back. <sighs> Honestly, text files are dumb too. And which is a weird thing to say for someone working on a text editor, but they are. It's just straight up, they're dumb. So let's see here. Buffer layout. Okay, I got the layout. I built it out of that. So I've got the face. I still need to figure out the visible range, right? That's the next problem. This isn't about to become a conversation about text files versus the future of programming. I did that last stream. I'm not archiving my answers on those questions. So, I don't know what the stream is or what the chat is saying, but there tends to be comments about things like that when I start talking like that. So, I'm just letting everyone know now that if I see anything about programming languages or text files, I'm going to ignore it today. Uh, because I've already answered it and we don't have time to get distracted. There's a lot to do. So, how do I compute my visible range? Well, I know that my one pass last has actually been passed into me right here. So, that's nice. Why don't we do this? My first, on the other hand, is a little bit more tricky, but not that much more tricky. What we need to do is we need to get the line number. Ah, okay. So we can take our buffer point here, and we can go, okay, um, buffer.cpp, line number. Get line index range. I don't even know what that does. Is that helpful to anybody? Ugh. Garbage. Okay. Yeah, a lot of this still hasn't gotten to the rewrite phase yet and is garbage. But it's fine. We'll leave it in because we will have to get too dis distracted to fix it right now. Um, all right, I want to get the buffer get first position from line number gap buffer i64 line number result one is less than equal to line number and line number is less than equal to buffer line count. Alright, so then what we can do is just grab this. It's basically the same exact thing. The only problem is the way I'm going to use this is a little different from the range thing. The range, if the range is zero, it doesn't matter what's in it. But here it matters what I return, even if I'm outside of those bounds. So really what I want to do is if line number is less than one, result equals zero. If line number is greater than line count, result equals buffer size and then finally those can Alex Kelbo what exactly is you working on today I will answer that today I am working on um, the new text layout system it's kind of an abstract situation and it's a little hard to describe once it's working a little bit more I can kind of demonstrate but essentially um, Everything, did you hear? Were you, you were just here for the thing where I said uh, 
did you hear me say this stuff about t creating a text layout and rendering it to the screen? Because that's what I'm working on today. If not, that's what I'm working on today. I'm sure that was helpful. I have absolute confidence that what I said made sense, and I'm not clarifying. <laughs> Alright, we need to take the buffer point um, to this first position from line number. Alright, we want to take the files buffer, buffer point, line number. Alright, so the buffer point basically tells me where in the buffer the layout begins, and it contains a line number, and that line number can give me the first position, and now my visible range is everything from first position to one pass last, with the exception that when I am done creating my layout, if the last index in the layout is less than one pass last, I need to clamp. So uh, visible range dot max equals clamp top of visible range dot max and um, the last okay so I need to come in here and figure out how I get the last thing um, the last thing oh it has an index range right there oh forget that wait <sighs> okay so we'll start with that and then we'll just say the visible range is the layouts index range and then we can do this more simply. Okay, so if this is going to contain the range already, for whatever other reason I already had to contain the range, all I have to do is modify the range in here at the end. So why don't I just say, let's keep track of, um, hmm, index. Okay, so when I get to the end of the loop, uh, whatever index I'm at is the end. So this dot max equals the index, right? That is the one pass last. Right? Okay, alright. This doesn't quite work. This doesn't work because... Oh, all I really need to store is the line numbers. I'm doing this the wrong way. You, you, you go. Alright, we need to change things a little bit. So I thought the text layout needed to actually contain its own copy of the layout, but that is dumb. I have a cached version of each line's layout in the buffer itself. So we're just going to rely on that and figure out what are the lines we need when we create the line layout. So we're going to create an interval visible line range or something like this, or visible line number range, right? <sighs> That's what we need. So the visible range will be deduced from that later. Um, this does mean that my constructor is a little bit wrong. Um, visible, I'm going to just call this line range, line number range, something like that. Well, if it's going to take an extra line either way, Visible line number range, line number range, visible line number range, there we go, we can take the layout stuff right on out of there, out of there, out of there, and then we can come over here to the API implementation and say this is all garbage, it's just fooey, um, this isn't how anything works, so we need, we need that, we need that, we will need this eventually, and we'll need that stuff, but the, mm, yeah, this is not quite real. What we really need is to take, um, yeah, we're going to take the range size of the visible range, um, like that, and then we're going to have, oh, 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 yikes visible line range right there um okay um okay so i have the face that i need what i need is 
to loop over the lines. Okay, right, I don't even need to use that call. I need to use this one. So this call here is the one that calls to the buffer layout system if it has not already got a cached version of the layout for that line. But if it does have a lit cached version of the layout for that line, you can see it's doing a table look up here and just grabbing me that with a table read instead of calling buffer layout. So here, we are basically, if we invoke through this, we'll be invoking through the cached layout per line. And then what we can do is just say that a text layout actually only needs to contain the range of lines as an interval and the metrics that combine them as a rectangle together. Um, and then the actual data can just remain in this cache and we'll retrieve it when we need it. That's, that's the level, that's the world we want to live in. So let's make that the world that we're living in. Um, we're gonna need a for loop that begins with um, da, 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 line number equals the buffer point. <sighs> line number, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't have virtual white space in this file, so I'm miserable. There we go. Um, we're gonna increment line number every time the loop goes through. And we're going to keep a like Y position thing, or like just like a Y even will be fine, right? So we'll just keep Ys like that, and then we're gonna grab our layouts like this. So hey, I want this line. What do you got there for me? And then what I do to actually answer that question is I call that function, and I give it the models, I give it the file, I give it the line number, I give it the layout dim width and I give it the face ID so I don't even need to grab the face boom we can just grab the face ID now that's a bit weird though isn't it because that means that it's going to be grabbing the face itself over and over again <sighs> most places that call this do so in a loop which could hoist this set font set face from ID call outside of the loop. If this was a video game, each of those all all caps things would be like bold and separately colored because they're the they're the primary concepts that I have re relationships to each other. You know, they have speci special game meaning. That's why they're all caps. Okay, so anyway, um, so I grab that there, I go, doo -doo -doo -doo, I put the face ID right there, and now I have a line, and the question is, did that line pass the bottom of my layout dim? Okay, so the one pass last thing, it's malarkey, it does not exist, that doesn't mean anything to me, goodbye. What was the big four coder decision? Um, okay, the what is the method I use? Okay, so since this is gonna keep happening all day, I'm just gonna answer your question with a with a solution that should be universal. So let me see here. Um, I need to add text.
There we go. Does that answer your question? If you have any follow-up questions, if that answers your question and you have follow-up questions, let me know. So I grab the line, and then what? I have a line just sitting here. What am I doing with it? I need to check and see if I'm past the end, right? So if y plus line dot height. Okay, so we need to know what the next y is going to be, essentially. <sighs> if next y is greater than or equal to the layout dims y, then we're done. We also need to say while the line number is less than or equal to the line count, and we'll get that up here. Okay, so there we go. And then we can go, okay, the interval from I so is the visible line number range. And that's just going to be, you know, whoops, everything from the buffer point dot line number all the way to the line number we had at the end of the iteration, right? So that's the everything visible on a range question being fully answered. Nope, not quite. Now it's fully answered. Um, but we need to then answer what answer what's the everything visible in the character range question. To do that, what I'm going to need is visible range equals, and then we need the start. Okay, so that's um, let's go over to buffer. Uh, buffer f start uh, position buffer range. Where's my interval? Internal interval. There we go. <sighs> Buffer, get first position from line number. Uh, the buffer, okay, you know what? I'm, I've, I've, I've referred to the buffer so many times at this point. Let's just pull that all the way out. Um, yeah, you. Alright, how long have I been streaming? Alright, perfect. It's been over an hour. So what I can do is I can stop whatever this nonsense music is. Like, it's just really garbage. And I can stop my stream, and then the archivable part will be separated off. I can archive all that, and then we can switch to a proper 4Coder Jam session. So I will be right back.